chapter 19, and I want us to look at, for just a moment, about Christ living in us, Christ living through us. This morning you're going to see, I guess you could call it, a next step in our movement with the Spirit and moving with the Spirit. You know, change in our lives sometimes, has to, we have to be led through it. Because when you're going from where you are to maybe where you've never been, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the good effect of the frog in the kettle. We've always heard of the frog in the kettle as a negative thing, you know, that, you know, in the culture, that we, the culture has completely changed temperatures, moving us away from our founding in America as God, with God in control and leading, and, and now we are, and we just kind of, the temperature's been turned up just enough that we're like a frog. If you just barely turn temperatures up in a frog, with the frog in the water, it won't jump out. It'll sit there and boil to death. But the same thing can be true with a... Now, if you, in other words, if you just threw it in a pot of hot water to jump out. The same is true when, when we're warming up to the things of the Lord. Guys, I want to tell you something. If you've never gone to where your life is is really seriously centered and anchored in Christ and in, and in the filling of the Spirit. We have a tendency, especially in this country, to, to just dismiss it or just say, well, that's just not my experience. I'm, I'm amazed about how often we, we build, we pick out a verse or two in the Bible and we build a doctrine around it and then we start to say that if something I see doesn't look like this, then that must be wrong. Well, you know, for the longest, I believed that I was just a sinner. There are only two types of people in the world. There were sinners and there were sinners saved by grace, but we're all still sinners. And I built my life around that because that's what I thought the Bible taught. The Bible doesn't teach that. It took Dr. Lewis Gregory about three and a half years to pull me out of that doctrinal quandary I was in to help me understand that when I become a Christian, I'm no longer a sinner. I'm a saint who sometimes sins and hates it. And that I'm no longer consumed by sin, that I'm no longer struggling in sin. Lewis took me out of chapter 7 in Romans to where I was, bl I, I was really seriously doing this. I was seriously looking at Romans chapter 7 when Paul talks about the struggle that people without Christ, but yet who were trying to fulfill the law, the struggle they're in. Those things they want to do, they can't do. And those things they don't want to do, those things they end up doing. That is not the struggle of a Christian. If, you're in, if you believe that you're a Christian and you're in that struggle, you've allowed yourself to be there. Because Romans chapter 6 is where I learned to live my life. Where, where he just basically says, you now have mastery over sin. And you don't have to do it. That doesn't mean I'm not capable of it. It just means I don't have to. I can choose not to because of the power of God living in me. Do you know how long it took me to move to that position? About three and a half years. Because I was so, so, so bound into what I believe, I thought the Bible said, what I had it taught to me from the time I was knee-high to a grasshopper on up. And so I know that if you're, if you're like me, and it took basically God blowing you like a, like a bomb, just blowing you out of where you were into where he is, I understand that. You see, because it came to a point when my wife was telling me, I'm going to leave you if things don't change. I talked to guys who told me that their wife left them. And I said, mine would have too, but thank God she gave me a warning shot. And gave me an opportunity to change. And so it was three and a half years that I, that, and I found out what the problem was. The problem was me, and the problem was I, and, and what I believed, what I thought I believed about the Bible. 
Now, I'm not trying to tell you the Bible's not true. I'm trying to tell you the Bible's true, and sometimes what we believe about it is not. And I know moving away from some of the doctrinal positions that maybe we've had our whole life into something else is difficult. I know how hard that is. But I was talking to some people this week and they said, you know, how, how come you talk so much about being filled with the Spirit? I said, because if it were not for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if it were not for God filling me with His Spirit, I would not be the person I am today. And, and, and so what I want us to do in, 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 in Acts chapter 19, verses uh, 1 through 8, 7, I want us to take a look at this, and I want you to see this scripture. See it for what it says, not for what you've been told. Let's just take a look at the Bible at what it says, not what we've been told it says. All right, listen carefully. When Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit, that there's anything such as the Holy Spirit. And Paul asked, Well, then what baptism did you receive? If they didn't know there was the Holy Spirit, what is he doing? He's going back and checking their pedigree. He's going back and checking, well, then, how, what did you guys get baptized? I said, well, we received John's baptism, they replied. Oh, okay. There are a lot of you out there because, there, you know, that, that's what he's saying. Okay, I understand. But then Paul says, well, guys, you need to understand that John's baptism was the baptism of repentance. We're going to come back to this in just a moment. But just remember something. When that, that many times we are told to repent... But there's nothing that's told to us about receiving. Stay with me. Paul said in verse 4, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. And on hearing this, in other words, they believed, and on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, we talked about this last week, that, it, that I know a lot of church traditions, and I get it. I understand church tradition. I do. You know, we baptize children, or, we, or you're confirmed at 12. The church basically directs your spiritual life for you by saying, well, you ought to be doing this by now. But on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When, and then after they were baptized, Paul placed his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came on them after they were baptized. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. Now I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people, including me, who would read that verse and then complete, read those verses and then completely ignore what they say and start telling you what they think they ought to say. In other words, well, this was just a special time when the Holy Spirit was new to everybody. And so when everybody was baptized, they were, you know, they never heard of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, they begin to explain away the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Believe me, I've done it for years. And so, basically, what I want us to understand is that there is salvation. That's Christ living in us. And then Christ living through us is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. That's the baptism. It's the power of God living through you. Or why else would... Let me ask you this. Okay, let's go with the... It's called the echo of Pentecost theory. That, that there was a Pentecost, in other words, there was a Pentecost and, and there was the baptism of the Spirit and there was, and there was speaking in tongues and, and other things. And, and then you come down to Samaria, there was another 
uh, it was an echo of Pentecost. In other words, it was just another Pentecost-type like thing. And then in chapter 19, there was another echo of Pentecost. In other words, it was, it was just kind of like, just like ripples of the water going out. And then after all these ripples were rippled, there was no more baptism of the Spirit. Now, I'm telling you, if you were raised in a Calvary Chapel, in a Baptist, in a Lutheran, in a Methodist, any traditional Presbyterian, most de uh, de denominations, that is what they teach. That is what the, the, the gifts, in other words, the gifts were tied to the apostles. When the apostles died, there were no more apostles. There were no more prophets. Those two gifts and those two offices went away when John died, when he died. That's just the position. I'm standing here to tell you, when we've been preaching it for months now, that is not true. That is not true. You know, I'm tired of reading parts of the Bible and somebody saying, well, that's not good for today. I'm tired of that. I want to experience, and I want, all I want is I want what the Scripture says I can have. I don't want, I don't want a, a jot or tittle less or, or a jot or tittle more. I don't want to make up stuff, but I want what the Scripture says. I want us to, to look at this for a second. Those aren't supposed to pop up yet. I thought I'd save that. Okay, reason. I want to take you through what we've been talking about. Remember we talked about over and over again in the book of Acts how the apostle Paul reasoned. He would, matter of fact, if you look in verse 8, after this encounter, and we're going to look at this next week in more detail. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the, king, about the kingdom of God. In other words, that's the reasoning that we're talking about. He's going there and reasoning. Well, reasoning leads to repentance. You remember when Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 2, when, the, when after they heard the message, they said they were cut to the heart, and they said, what, can, what are we supposed to do about this? Peter said, repent. That's the first thing he came out of his mouth was repent. Now, repenting, and the reason why repenting is difficult for us is because if you look, I just put up, we're, we're losing control. Repenting is surrendering. And I'm telling you, we like to be in control. But Peter also said, watch what's coming up. He also said, repent and receive. You see, there is a receiving that is to be done. And I'm going to show you how just repentance in a moment is not enough. You have to repent and receive. Now, what, are we, what do we receive? We receive salvation. That's the very first thing. Romans chapter 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. We receive salvation. When we repent, we are supposed to receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts 19, 2. Why, did, why, why didn't Paul, when they were baptized, just get them out of the water and say, Man, that's it. He then laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. All I'm doing is reporting. I'm not asking you if that's your experience. I'm just saying that he, they received the Holy Spirit. Then the scripture talks about in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. Remember when we took a few months to go through that? There are gifts, there are callings, there's different anointings. There's, call it whatever you want. That we are to receive. Then there's deliverance. You know, when, we, when God changes our minds and He changes the way we live and changes and gets rid of those things in our hearts and our lives that have been eating us up our whole life, then there's, we learn to walk in inner healing to where we begin to walk in the miracle in which God made us. I want to put this up here one more time because we looked at it a few weeks ago. This is Mickey, and this is, uh, this is actually your spiritual anatomy for you new folks. We have a soul. We are a soul with a body and a spirit. It is through the body our soul communicates with the world. 
It's through our spirits that we communicate to the God of heaven. We have a mind, which is not our brain. They're different things. We have an emotions, our feelers, and we have a will, which is our chooser. See that hole in the middle right here? It's our, it's, it, that hole is like a big puzzle piece that's empty. That where our, that's where our needs to be loved, accepted, and self-worth were, are, right there. All right, now, before we're a Christian, we are dead spiritually. That's what, that's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. That before you know Christ, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Which means what? I've always met my needs to be loved, accepted, and for self-worth in fleshly and worldly ways. Does that make sense? So what it means, I've learned to think. I've learned to f the things that I think first. The emotions I feel are tied to worldly things because I've been choosing it a bad way my whole life. Now I'm going to pop up three phrases up there under the brain. Some of you have not gone this far in this illustration. In the brain, you have what I call memory traces, habit patterns, and coping skills. In your brain, memory traces are, are thoughts, are images, are attitudes that just go looping through your brain. It's kind of like a bad song that I'm not going to sing to get stuck in your head. It's kind of like a bad song that just keeps looping. Now, from these messages, they determine your habits. And your, and your habit patterns. You've developed unhealthy habit patterns which have led to coping. In other words, you're getting through life and you're not living. Most people, the majority of people, including Christians, are not living. They're, 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 they're saved, but they're still living as though they're not because they haven't dealt with these strongholds. Now, what happens at salvation is that the Holy Spirit kicks in and we become alive in Christ. Now, that's alive in our spirits. Now, the, 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 the fallacy with thinking that salvation is all I need is that the only thing your salvation did, well, there are six miracles I'm not going to go into, but basically your salvation opened up your relationship to Christ and, and you became saved in your spirit. But, however, even though you're saved, all you've ever done was think and feel and cope your whole life. So what has to happen is you need to move from where you're living like you're living to where you're living in a way that's filled with the Spirit and alive in Christ. Basically, what happens is, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, what happens is you have a flood from your spirit into your soul but however, remember, you still have these strongholds. And that what happens is the Holy Spirit comes in and floods your entire being. And the flood happens from the inside. Okay? And then, but however, you've got to move. In other words, the move from, from believing and thinking like the world to believing and thinking and living in Christ is deliverance and inner healing. Let me just, let me just explain the difference right now. Let's say that the hurts and the pains and the thoughts are like a meteor, a meteorite. They come in and they crash into your, your soul. Your soul is the earth. And what happens now is you have what? You have a meteor and you have a crater. Deliverance is getting rid of the, of the meteorite. And what happens is, you now you have a hole that needs to be filled. And then what that healing is, the inner healing, is when God begins to fill in the hole. What can happen to you, and the scripture talks about this, and guys, this is demonic. I know that's a word that divides people, but that's what it is. Just go with me here. You, that demonic influence impacts your life. With deliverance, it's cast out. If you don't fill in the hole with the good things of God, what happens, class? 
it comes in and you've got a you got now you've got a huge hole seven times bigger than the one you've had so what comes out the deliverance and the inner healing comes guys uh, and then what ends up happening is you end up to where your actions begin to match who you are is this un is this good okay this is where psychiatry and, and secular counseling can't help you. It can't help you. Guys, listen to me. How many of you have ever worked in an elementary school before? What time norm what, what normally happens in the morning about, I don't know, I'm going to guess the time between 9 and 10 o'clock or somewhere in there. What normally happens? Yeah, but what happens at the office? They line up for medication. Go to any elementary school. And at mid-morning, at some point, Cindy, am I wrong? Oh, I'm sorry, right after lunch. Okay, right after lunch. Have you ever been to the office during medication time? There's a line down the hall am I wrong with kids getting strong narcotics happens every single day I was talking to a youth minister I was talking to a youth minister that took a hundred kids to camp a hundred kids to camp got time for medication and so many of the kids that went to camp or on medication that it took them three hours to get the kids their medications. Did you know, did you know, surveys are out now from reliable sources like George Barner that the number one killer of adults in America now is drugs. Illicit drugs, and prescribed drugs. There, there's more people that die of drugs, from drugs, than uh, all automobile accidents and, gun, and gunshots combined. What does this tell us? Now, let me tell you, if you're on medication, I'm not preaching bad at you today. I'm not, I've been on medications. I'm not saying you're bad for taking medicine. Don't get that point. Don't get that out of this. Don't you go home and cold turkey quit your medicine. It could kill you. <laughs> Betty, can it kill you? Yes. It could kill you. Yeah. Now, now let me tell you this. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. This is the most powerful thing you'll ever hear in your life. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses, isn't this sad? All the king had to offer. The best that the king could bring could not put Humpty back together again. Guys, listen to me. We live in a that we live in a Humpty Dumpty world filled with Humpty Dumpty people who are looking for answers. And we're looking for ways to deal with life. We're looking for ways. Let me ask you this, my friends. You believe baptism in the Spirit is spooky, but you're willing to believe that filling your body up with narcotics is normal? Think about that. Think about that. Let that sink in. 
And, and I'm not, I, I, look, do not, do not go home and quit taking your medicine. That is not the message. But this morning, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not for salvation. Salvation, and you notice when we put up the, the Spirit, when the, you know, the Spirit, let me get it back up here. Salvation is a complete act. Salvation is God's grace in our what? In our faith. Faith in, faith in, in grace. I'm not trying to say you need to do anything else to be saved. I'm just saying you need more. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need those strongholds dealt with. You need deliverance and inner healing. How do I know that? You've been living in this world. Good gracious, look at the things we call normal. And then you'll impact the world. Let me get back here. Uh, you receive and then you release. And what is the release? The release is Christ lives His life through us. This is how it happens. Then how do we get from... Reason to repent, to receive faith. What is faith? Faith is trust. It's transparency. It's being open with God. It's allowing God shining light into the deep inner parts of our soul. And we trust God enough that He's right and I'm not. Let's talk about faith. And faith is in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Let me tell you what I've done. I took, I think, four different translations in the Bible, and I want you to see these four different ways that Hebrews 11.1 1 is interpreted. They're similar but different. The New King James Version says, Now faith is the, what class? Substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So faith is substance and evidence. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what's not seen. Let's take a look. Whoop, I tell you, this thing, it does this to me occasionally. Let's take a look at the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. And it gives us assurance about the things we cannot see. Now, let's look at the English Standard Version. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Now what I've done is I've taken these words about what these Bible verses say that faith is and I'm just separating them and putting them up on the screen for you. That now faith is substance. Faith is evidence. Faith is reality. Faith is confidence. Faith is assurance that God is right. Faith is the conviction and faith is your proof. You need, do you need proof that God can do something? Have faith. That's the proof. And faith is the oil that greases this whole engine. Now, we're not done with this. As you can tell, I'm very, I'm very visual. I hope this isn't confusing anyone. This is how Gary thinks. Now, let me tell you what my experience is, and perhaps your experience is the same as mine that we have reason to bring us to repentance, but instead of receiving, we rededicate. We rededicate our lives. Wait a minute, wait a minute, what does that mean? I rededicate my life. I'll tell you what it means. It means that you, that, 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 that you don't receive, you don't release, and you never receive anything but salvation. Because what happens is, reason, we repent, and maybe we've received salvation, but our doctrine has said, we don't need to receive anything else. So if things are going awry in your life, and your flesh is getting the best of you, you must need to rededicate your life. Right? Guys, look. Can you see this? And then what ends up happening 
is we go back to reason, which is a good thing. You'll see that in a minute. But then we go back to the Bible. We end up still stuck in our sins, so we end up repenting again, usually of the same stuff. Then what do you do? You rededicate. And then after a few cycles of that, you go, well, maybe I need to mix a baptism in with this. Maybe I need to get baptized again. That, that's true, but it's not the water baptism. And we keep going back. Maybe I need to nail it down and make sure I'm saved. In other words, when we keep hitting that dead end, we keep going back to the birth experience because we're told that's all we need. I must not be doing something right. You are not doing something right. Listen carefully. You're trying to live your life, try, you're, you're living the, what you think is life, trying not to sin instead of following Jesus. I remember one time at halftime of one of my basketball games in high school. My coach was a Christian man. Never heard a cuss word come out of his mouth. We prayed all the time. Today he'd have been fired 16 times a week, I'm sure. And Coach Dubos came up to me. We were playing Wheeler High School, second-ranked team in the state. We were not the second-ranked team in the state. And the fact that we we're only four down at four points down at halftime was a miracle. <laughs> and so Coach Dubos came over to me and he showed me the stat book. He said, Gary, you've got no fouls and no turnovers. And I said, you also have no points and no rebounds. What are you doing out there? Sounds like to me you're playing not to foul and you're praying not to make a mistake instead of playing to win. Listen to that man's wisdom. My, my, listen guys, we were, da we were losing but I hadn't made a mistake. Guys, listen, God didn't put us on the team to focus on not making a mistake. He put us on the team to win. Amen. Amen. Coach Dubose looked at me. He was about 6'8", and he looked down at me. Big old frame guy played his basketball at LSU. He looked down at me, and he said, now, okay, there are two 6'8 All-Americans. All-Americans, guys. These guys were tough. Not all county, not all state. They were All-Americans. And you're 6'3. He said, but this is your house. This is our gym. And we treat visitors rude, rudely here. You quit playing around, trying, it's afraid of the giants. You get out there, young man, and if I don't see you playing the kind of ball that you can play the first five minutes, you can watch the rest of the game with me. I went out there like a man on fire. And I want to tell you something. For 16 minutes, you have two eight-minute quarters in high school back then, or they still do, I don't know. That was back... People say, why do they call basketball the rock? I said, because that's what we played with. <laughs> anyway, you know, I'm that old. But I want you to know, I got out there and played the second half of my life and led that team back to a victory. But let me tell you, the victory only happened when I quit, try, when I quit trying not to sin. And I just let the basketball that was in me that coach knew was there come out guys the problem that we have in our lives is that we've made Christianity about rules and we've made it about sin and avoiding sin and we've made it about oh we've even glorified it with 12 steps where if you don't sin you get a coin if you don't sin for another week you get another coin and we've made it all about being sober, and we've made it all about not sinning. 
But let me tell you something, my friends. That is not what Jesus Christ came to save you for. He did not come to save you, to keep you locked in another. Instead of, instead of being lost in your sin, you're lost in a trap of trying not to. Can anybody identify with that? No, he wants to bring you to life. To reason, yes, we always, look at this, it's cyclical. We always need to have the Word of God spoke to us. We always need to be able to understand more about who Jesus is. But the idea is by faith to lead us to repent. And not just to repent, but to receive what it is God has for us so that He might release it in our lives. That's what it's all about. Guys, it's time to receive. It's time to receive. And I'm not just talking about metaphorically. I'm talking about right now. It's time to receive. I want you to put yourself on that ladder. I kind of tried to make it like a Star Wars. Da, 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 it's time to receive. You know, and Christ's power and spirit and coming up like a Star Wars movie. didn't work too good. But anyway, put your, I want you to look at those up there. Where are you on that ladder? Do you need to be saved this morning? Do you need to receive the life of Christ? Do you know that you know that you know that Jesus is yours and that his life lives in you? Do you need the Spirit's power? Do you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You know that you're saved, but you've never really seen. You know, Paul said to the Corinthians, I'm sorry I can't come to see you today because I want to impart some gift to you. Well, I want to impart some gift to you today. Not that I am a super Christian, but I'm telling you something. The Spirit imparts the Spirit through those that have it sometimes. And I would love to impart to you. I would love to pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit this morning in power. Perhaps gifts and calling is where you are. You're stuck. You don't know what God has for you. You're living in the power, but you're living in confusion. Come on up. You know, deliverance. Maybe you've, you know, and, and again, re look back at Mickey. I'm, look, I used to believe that the demonic could not harm Christians. Well, it can not in your spirit where Christ has filled you. No, you understand. It's in your mind. Strongholds are here. And, and sometimes, you know, I, you know, let me tell you, have you noticed that everybody comes walking through the door? They've always, they've they got issues. Everybody that walks through this door has got issues. Are you ready to get rid of the issues? And then are you really ready to start walking and healing? Walking in new life. I'm going to ask Gary to come up. And come on up here with him, Tiffany. And I want us, you know, I'm, you know, the, the little bit of singing we did and then, and then the little bit of preaching I did, you know, if I let you out now, you would wonder, my goodness, that's just an hour. So I can't let you out now. <laughs> not, when, not, not when it's time to receive. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. I want you, that transparency and trust thing, that faith thing. Go ahead, Gary, you can play. I don't, well, if we got the words. What is it? Oh. I want you to have the faith this morning to step out. I used to wonder why we had invitations at the end of worship services. But let me tell you why we do. There's something about stepping out, stepping out and acting 
on what you believe God wants you to do that kind of helps solidify it. Did you know secrecy is Satan's weapon to keep you in prison? If you want me to, I'll be first. I am weak, but he is strong. And I stand before you on one side, a frail human being who's in need of a touch for God. And I would love to have somebody here that feels led to, to come pray for me. That, the God, that God may fill me anew in His Holy Spirit. There, I was the first one. You don't have to be. But we're going to stand up, we're going to sing these songs.